break. Um, plus, I'm not sure my my uh, lectures would have made a whole lot of sense. I'm not sure how coherent I was. So it's probably for the best that we didn't have those lectures. Um, that said, I heard there was a little bit of, uh, of panic regarding counting protons, neutrons, and electrons on the quiz because we didn't officially cover that stuff in this class. But that said, I think that everybody's had chemistry before, right? Did it feel like too much of a stretch given the rest of the slides that were available and what you knew? Was it was that too much of a stretch to ask you to do that on a on the quiz? Some nods, some shakes. All right. So um, I'm not going to pretend that this was some part of some master plan, but this is a good place that for you um, for you all to learn a little bit about college courses. College courses, our lectures don't always get through all the material we need to get through. And I typically slow down my lectures and wind up going back and recovering them, make sure we cover everything. Um, not every instructor will do that. And sometimes even I, as kind as I am, wind up being um, you know, under the gun in terms of, well, what are we gonna do for this, for this quiz? Because we really hadn't covered that much material I could trust you or I could test you on. Um, you got to read the rest of the the slides too. But two slides past where we stopped was page that was the slide that talks about protons, neutrons, and electrons and how to count them and what the different terms mean, what the notations mean. Um, so it was there on the on Canvas for you to look up. Um, that said, I'm gonna obviously gonna grade these pretty leniently when I get around to going back and assigning partial credit for them. But um, just because you get a quiz question or a homework question on something we haven't covered doesn't mean you should just leave it blank. Do your best. There's lots of good online resources these days. Um, and I will try not to do that to you too often. Uh, we just kind of wound up in a weird spot timing wise with spring break and everything. So um, don't be too panicked about that. Um, any any questions about about the quiz in general? Like I said, I haven't done the um, I haven't gone back and assigned partial credit. And like I said, I'll be pretty generous with that. I'm usually pretty generous with partial credit. Um, but uh, we'll I'll go back and do that probably tomorrow afternoon. I'll get a chance to sit down and do that. If not tonight, maybe tonight. All right. Um, a few notes about this week's schedule. Um, obviously, I didn't plan on being sick. Uh, if I had known I was going to miss a whole week with you, well, almost two thirds of a week with y'all, um, I would not have agreed to be on this hiring committee that I'm on on Thursday and Friday. So I'm going to be not be here Friday again this week. Um, but since we've already used up all of our all of our um, uh, to be determined days as far as scheduling. Um, I'm going to have my colleague from the college, uh, Dr. Franz, um, Carl is going to come in and he's going to talk to you and probably work on Excel spreadsheets with you this week. So what we'll do is I'm on today and on Wednesday um, will we'll be lecture material and then you'll have a homework assignment for Tuesday and Thursday. And then Carl's going to introduce you to how Excel spreadsheets work. Um, not, I keep saying Excel, but any spreadsheets, um, and Google sheets works just as well. Some of the formatting is just a little different. If he's going to work you through, uh, work with you on that assignment on Friday. And that is, so that assignment will be due a week from this Friday. So you'll have a chance to ask me questions about it the following Monday. Um, you'll like, you'll like Carl. He's a really fun guy. Um, he brews his own kombucha. He used to work for Genentech. He's, he's a microbiologist, not a not a true, not strict chemist. Um, but there's enough overlap and our teaching styles work really well together. So should work pretty well on Friday. But don't be don't be panicked when I'm not here again this Friday. It's um, I just uh, overcommitted myself for the amount of time and illness I've already had this quarter. All right. So with that said, let's talk officially about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, I'm going to, because I do know that most of you have, most of you have, have done this to some extent before. Um, we're still going to frame it in the context of 
of the history of science here. Um, so we look a little bit about how they got to these ideas, not just memorizing the procedure. Here's how you know how many protons there are. We're going to talk about um, how they got the evidence. So where we ended, as I recall, two weeks ago today, we talked about Dalton's atomic theory and how it needed to be adjusted because um, pretty quickly after Dalton's atomic theory was, was discovered, um, they started finding evidence for things like electrons. I mean, in the, does anybody remember what the evidence was for electrons? How do they know that they had electrons? The cathode rays, yeah. Basically, they were able to find something that had a negative charge that was smaller than hydrogen. And up to that point, hydrogen was the smallest particle known, known to man. And it was about 2,000 times smaller by mass than hydrogen. And so that told them that you had to have smaller pieces. It wasn't just atoms. It wasn't just um, these, what they considered to be individual, indivisible pieces. They had to have something else present. If they didn't have something smaller than atoms, then how do you get electrons that are that much smaller? Um, and that was right around the same time as Mendeleev had started organizing his his um, periodic table. These were all happening kind of simultaneously. Um, and then from the discovery of electrons, though, we could make one more conclusion, right? If we know that electrons are negative, and every atom has electrons and atoms are neutral, what do we know about what else must be present in terms of the makeup of these atoms? It has to be something positive, right? If the atoms are neutral and electrons are negative, you have to have something positive to balance that charge out. All right, which brings us to, we get to the four pudding model? Did we mention that? Um, so this is what's called the plum pudding model of an atom. So this was actually Thompson who discovered electrons. This is how he rationalized how, where electrons came from. Atoms were these tiny indivisible particles. Um, but if you applied a big enough voltage, you could get these electrons to fly out of them. And so he said, okay, well, that's, probably because these electrons are sort of embedded in this gelatinous mess um, that he made the analogy being, being Scottish, he made an analogy to a gross British dessert um, called a plum pudding, which is what in America we call a fruitcake, um, which I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I really don't go for cooked fruit. Um, it's not my thing. And so plum puddings don't really sound all that appealing to me. I've found pictures before and they look as bad as you can imagine and a dessert involving cooked plums from the 1800s. Um, so, but what matters more about that here is the idea that the electrons were behaving as these plums. They were sort of embedded in the cake part of the material, the pudding part of the material. Um, and Thompson's theory was that or his hypothesis was that this is what's happening. If you apply enough voltage, you can basically suck the plums out of the pudding. And that's what was happening in his cathode ray tubes. There's these negatively charged plums were flying through this vacuum. Um, and so his student Rutherford, I almost used the wrong name. His student Rutherford um, winds up trying to design an experiment to, to provide further evidence for this plum pudding model. Now, you can probably guess based on the fact that you've never heard of the plum pudding model before. Um, this is not actually how atoms are, are built, right? But put yourself in the shoes of Rutherford. He's been taught by Thompson who discovered the electron, didn't win a Nobel prize because Nobel prizes didn't exist yet, but would have won a Nobel prize in physics um, for his discovery. And you're, you're learning from this, this um, professor, and this is his pet theory. This is what he believes um, explains the evidence best. So Rutherford tries to design an experiment to provide additional evidence for this, 
Rutherford's big contribution was going to be that he was going to prove you, in sciences, you don't really ever prove something to be true. You just provide evidence that it's not false. And so that's what Rutherford was trying to do. He was trying to design an experiment to, to show that. And the, the experiment that he designed, that was weird. Huh. Um, it was basically, he was gonna find these things called alpha particles, which were positively charged and they were pretty big. And he was going to fire these alpha particles at a really, really thin sheet of gold. Basically, gold is gold was chosen because it's pretty dense, but more importantly, it's what's called malleable. Does anybody know what malleable means? It's kind of flexible. In, in everyday terms, it means flexible. It actually comes, the um, etymology of it is it comes from the Latin word malleus, meaning hammer. Um, malleable means you can literally hammer it into a foil. You just pound on it and it smooths, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And you can you can hammer gold to the point where it's transparent, where you can see through it. Um, but it's still one uniform sheet of foil. Um, another, another interesting place that word shows up, malleus, um, is, uh, is actually the French word for hammer in the Middle Ages was um, something based around Martel. So Charlemagne's son, um, Charles Martel, is known as Charles the Hammer, which is a pretty badass name for a king when you think about it. Um, also, the uh, Malleus Maleficarum, has anybody heard that term before? Is the document that was used by the Inquisition when hunting witches in the Middle Ages. Um, it literally means hammer of witches. AFI has a really good punk song about that called Malleus Maleficarum. It's a pretty good one if you're into that sort of thing. Um, all right. So what does this mean as far as our experiments get back on topic here? Um, what, what was expected is if each of this, let's say it's just a few atoms thick. We have a, these atoms. They're all made up of this plum pudding stuff. And the plum pudding material was positive. The pudding material was the, the plums, the electrons are negative. When you fire a positively charged particle at these, these puddings that are positively charged, the thinking was that if you knew the velocity before and you could measure the velocity afterwards, it should be slow because you're, you're literally throwing something through a film. Like, I don't know what a, another good example was, would be off the top of my head. Um, but, but you can imagine trying to break through a sheet of drywall, maybe running through. Uh, if anybody watched the uh, NFL All-Star game where they had to break through the drywall walls and they were timed on that part, like they're moving slower when you get through the wall. Right. So that was the thinking. This was Rutherford's experiment. Um, he's like, OK, cool. This is going to be really easy. I'm just going to measure the speed before and after. And that's going to that's going to show that we have more evidence for this. But what we, he actually saw when he did this is that almost all of the alpha particles went straight through the material, straight through the gold foil, and never slowed down at all. There was no evidence they had actually touched anything, had gone through anything at all, um, except that a small fraction of them were reflected in random, seemingly random directions. Um, and he couldn't quite figure out why this would be the case at first. And I, I'm i going off of memory here, but as I recall, this actually caused kind of a big fight between Rutherford and his teacher, Thompson, because Rutherford, when trying to support Thompson's theory, um, in fact, disproved it. Um, and rather, so Rutherford had to come up with another theory to explain this, and he had to do it in a way that was going to allow his, uh, his advisor to um, be willing to hear it. Um, and not, you know, go go full burning bridges mode. Um, and so this it was it was a really interesting period. And what he came up with was what's known as the nuclear theory. So the only thing that really explains why every one of these alpha almost all of these alpha particles go straight through without moving, without changing velocity, is because these atoms are almost entirely empty space. And what little, 
what little amount of the volume actually has mass and positive charge is concentrated in one tiny little section of the atom. Right, so and that's what he called the nucleus. So that actually, that term actually comes from the biology term for the nucle um, cell nucleus, um, which, was, which was already known at this point. And the positive charge being um, concentrated in the nucleus means that unless one of these alpha particles happens to get really close to the nucleus, it's gonna act like nothing changed. It's just gonna move straight through. It just went straight through empty space. And the, that nucleus is made of a discrete number of protons. Discrete because they knew that you could lose a discrete number of electrons. Discrete meaning a whole number, an integer value. And so we said, what well, if you have a discrete number of electrons, you have to have a discrete number of protons because they have to be changing by an integer value, these charges. Uh, and then the electrons, are kind of spread around the outside of the nucleus. So this is the, the idea or the view of an atom that you're probably most common or most familiar with. Um, you know, if you've ever seen the, the drawings that look like this. Oops, yeah. I got ahead of myself. Representing an atom. We're going to get into what these circles are, but basically that dot in the middle is representing the nucleus and these circles around the outside represent the path of electrons. We'll get into why this is not accurate here in a minute. Um, but basically this was sort of an amendment to atomic theory. There was atomic theory that said atoms exist. And then there was the nuclear that says, here's how the atoms are built. Built is the wrong term, um, are organized. All right. Is there anything else about this I was going to talk about? There was something else. I'm sure it'll come to me. So knowing that we have these protons and electrons, this is actually going to give us a lot more structure to the periodic table. Instead of just arranging them by mass, like Mendeleev, and sort of saying, well, they kind of behave the same way. That's why they belong in the same, in the same column. Um, this allows us to define our terms a little bit better. So an element is a different type of atom. We've used that term a little bit already. Um, and it, this was actually, the nuclear theory was actually the first time they were able to sort of define what makes one element different from another element. And they said that elements are defined by the number of protons they have in the nucleus. So basically you can't change the number of protons in the nucleus without changing what type of element it is. Which is also further kind of supports the atomic theory. When you get to that, remember that, that atomic theory was based on the idea of cutting a piece of copper in half and then in half and then in half until you get to a point where you can't do that anymore. That still works. If you cut copper in a single copper atom in half, it's not copper anymore because you changed how many protons are in the nucleus by doing that. It's still the same mass roughly, but it's not the same element anymore. So it's not that your atomic theory really was wrong. We can just add this as sort of an amendment to that to help full further explain how atomic theory works. Um, and the atomic number, so the element, we talked about the element name um, and the atomic symbol and the atomic number are three pieces of, of information that are all synonyms, basically. They're all, it's actually a little redundant. When you look at what's on the periodic table, you say, you see this on the periodic table? That's three pieces of information that all say the exact same thing. Beryllium, by definition, means the same thing as BE. And BE and beryllium, by definition, have to have four protons in the nucleus. Right. So in theory, you actually don't need an element name or an element symbol. You could just do it all 
by saying there's this many protons in this nucleus. That just gets a little confusing to try and do that. So we have element names partly for historical reasons because it already started classifying elements by name, um, but also just for convenience. Um, the way that the physicists look at this is physicist just says that you've got a nucleus and Z equals four. Z is the number of protons in the nucleus if you're talking to a physicist. So you could do that, but that doesn't allow us to get to more complicated things like molecular formula where we have to say, okay, well, we have this nucleus that has four protons and we have two of these nuclei together in this formula. It starts getting really kind of hard to, to separate what all these different numbers mean, which is one of the reasons why we also use these depending on the context. Right. And so this is as good a time as any um, to bring up that you're going to have a closed book quiz, one of two in this class, maybe three, depending. Um, that closed book quiz and is also going to, you're not going to even take it here. This will be the one time in this class where I take away your periodic table. After this quiz, you will have your periodic table for everything for the rest of the class. But you need to know your atomic symbols and your element names backward and forward. So basically what your quiz is going to be is it's going to be um, 30 questions, 20 of them. I'm going to give you the element name and you write me the symbol. 10 of them. I give you the symbol. You write the name. Just that you don't have to show where they are on the periodic table. Does You don't need the number going with it. You just have to know that BE means beryllium. Spelling does, it has to be correct enough, which is sort of vague, but basically if a reasonable person who's taken a chemistry class can, re can look at what you wrote and get to the right element, then I consider that good enough. Um, if you did something like leave off a whole syllable, then I'm probably going to take off half a point. Um, you do something like change a really important letter, like if you spelled zinc, Z I N K. Okay, that looks weird. Um, but everybody still knows that that's zinc, right? They just like what what's wrong with you? How come you don't have to spell zinc? But that's still zinc, right? If you spelled zinc with an L, that's not reasonable, right? Please sound out. Soundable. Sound outable is fine. If your handwriting's that bad, then I still have to take off the points. You got to get it relatively close. It's got to be legible. I'm pretty generous with that though, right? So take your time on those ones. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this is that capitalization matters for the element symbols. Just like with units, there's a big difference between These two, CI is carbon with an iodide. CL, capital C, lowercase l, is chlorine. So you can't mix and match your, your capitals and your lowercase. You have to be very, very clear. Um, and one, the, I use this as the example because what's that? Either. Either one. We can't have ambiguity when it comes to these. So you may need to adjust your handwriting slightly uh, when it comes to writing these sil these symbols. I don't usually write my L's like this. Only when I'm writing atomic symbols, because this was drilled into me when I was in high school, that when you write an L in an atomic symbol, you do as a cursive L, so nobody can mistake it. Or you could do it, make sure that you put the tail on it, so I can know that that's an L, not an I. If you're going to write an I, do it like this, not like that. Okay. So, you know, I tend to get a little bit picky about this. It's not going to be a huge deal if you can't keep them straight, but do your best to make sure that you're make, being very clear, explicit with your handwriting, whether it's a capital or a lowercase of something. Um, I'm trying to think of what. So, you know, I don't, I don't even particular. I don't use that font 
when I make a periodic table, I, I use a font that makes it very clear whether it's an uppercase I or a lowercase L for that reason. It'll be every element. I'm only gonna ask you about 30 of them and they're gonna be focused more on the top five rows probably, but everything's fair game. There'll be at least a couple from the bottom half of the periodic table, right? Most of them aren't gonna be that hard to learn. You already know most of them, most of them are cognates where they're really close to what their name is, right? Like CL is chlorine. Um, some of them are nothing like their names, right? What's one that's nothing like its name? Iron. Iron. There's some more examples I'm hearing too, right? What was that? Potassium. Sodium. Uh, HG, AGAU. Those are some of the most common ones. PV, yeah. And then this is just, this is eight of them <laughs> that are not matched up. What I find helpful when studying these is one, you can brute force memorize these, right? Flashcards are your friends when it's coming to something to a quiz like this. Um, I actually find it more interesting to go and learn why they have these names or these symbols. Does anybody know why iron is FE? What is it? It's the Latin name. Most of these have been known for a long, long time. So they're not named in English, they're named in Latin or some other language. So iron is ferrum, um, callum, potassium is callum. Um, let's see, if, because it's callum in Latin and its name potassium comes from the Germanic word potash, um, which was the word, which was the, uh, the lye that they would use to make soap in the Middle Ages, um, was came, made from a mineral called potash. Um, now we would call it potassium hydroxide. Um, N is for natrium, or Na is for natrium. Which one's this? Silver. What's the Latin word for silver? Anybody know it? It's very close to the name in Spanish or Portuguese. Argentum. I think, uh, is it Argenta maybe in Spanish? Not magenta. Um, Argentum. I remember that one because there's a river in South America. Um, actually, it might actually be where Argentina gets its name originally. Because um, the river, there's a river um, in Argentina that is, oh no, it's Plata in Spanish, isn't it? So that's a false cognate in that case. Um, Portuguese, though, Argent Argentum is very close to silver. Um, the reason that's significant because it also helps with this one. What's this one? Mercury. Does anybody know the the historical name for mercury? What they called it before they called it mercury? It's a, it's a surfing clothing brand these days. Quicksilver. They called it quicksilver. In Latin, it was hydro argentum. Literally, it was literally liquid silver was the name in Latin. Um, so hydro argentum is where we get HG. Argentum, this is auric or aurum. Auric is one of the versions of it. Um, plumbum for lead. Um, which, anybody ever done any construction work? Does anybody know how you, uh, how you define um, straight up and down if you don't have a level? Use a plumb bob. A plumb bob is literally a piece of lead on a string. You hold it up like this, it makes a straight line that's perfectly vertical. That gets its name from the Latin word for lead. Plumbum turned into plumb bob. A plumb bob is literally just a lead weight on a string. A plumb bob. And this one's kind of fun because this one's not Latin. Um, what is this one in English? Tungsten doesn't even have a W in it, um, but it's 
tungsten's symbol is W because two different research groups discovered it at roughly the same time, one in England and one in Germany. And the group in Germany, um, their compromise as to who gets to name it was that the, one of the groups got to pick the symbol and the other group got to pick the name. So the English group got to pick tungsten as the name. W is for the German word Wolfram. So in, if you actually look at a periodic table in German, it actually says Wolfram instead of tungsten um, for, for the element that has the symbol W. So things like that, that's your mileage may vary with this. I find stuff like this really, really interesting looking at some of the historical reasons for these names. That said, flashcards, can't go wrong with flashcards. Make your flashcards, test your flashcards. Um, there's actually, there was a guy who used to live on the North Shore of Lake Tahoe, whose name is on the periodic table. Another one of the ones at the bottom. Um, Glenn Seaborg was, uh, so Seaborgium is one of the last ones added. Uh, and I might, I, you see it over there? 106. 106, thank you. Um, yeah, SG. 106. Glenn Seaborg's research group discovered like four of the synthetic elements in the very bottom row before that. And so when he retired and his group, his uh, students went on to find another element after he retired and moved up to Incline Village, um, they named an element after him. So um, I actually, when I first started teaching, I worked at SNC and in, in Incline Village, and there was actually a periodic table there that was signed by Glenn Seaborg. Um, because he lived in the area, which, you know, chem chemistry rock star, um, even if nobody else knows who his name is, but all right. So let's see, today's Monday, let's say a week from tomorrow, we'll have that quiz. Eight days, enough time to get to get some flashcards down. And you, I won't give you an additional quiz over the weekend. Your quiz over the weekend will be studying for the quiz you know, on Tuesday. Okay? All right. All right. So if we can't, if we change the number of protons, the number of protons is set by the atomic number, which is a synonym to the element name and the atomic symbol. What happens if we change some of the other particle? What if we change the number of electrons, what happens? That's not changing the element, is it? What is that doing? We say that that's just changing the charge. The charge on an atom is defined by how many protons and electrons you have. It's the difference between the two. So the element, defined by protons. And, and our shorthand for protons is a lowercase p with a plus symbol. The charge or the ion is defined by number of electrons. So that's our shorthand for electrons. We use that one a lot more commonly than, than protons. And lowercase e with a negative symbol, the negative sign is an electron. So atoms by definition are neutral, which means if you have an, an atom, if you have a neutral particle, what do you know about the number of protons and electrons? They must be the same. And if you have an ion, for instance, if we had, say, lead with a plus two, the fact that it's lead tells us how many protons it has. How many protons does lead have? 82, down there right next to bismuth. How many electrons 
does this ion have? 80. We have a plus two charge, which means we have two extra protons. Right, so based on what the element is and what the charge is, you can always, always work out how many electrons you have. Figuring out how many protons you have is easy. Don't even, the charge doesn't matter when it comes to figuring out how many protons it has. All that matters is what is the symbol that's written down here, right? Or the element name, if you're given the name instead. The charge is going to be defined by what your element is and how many electrons you have, okay? All right, questions on any of that so far? We have one more subatomic particle to add. And the evidence for that, going back to the 1800s, is the fact that, well, they knew that hydrogen had one proton and one electron when it was neutral. They knew that helium had two protons, but helium weighed four times as much as hydrogen. Well, you can't have something that is four times heavier, but only twice as many protons. So they said, well, the extra mass, they just came up with a name and said, well, it doesn't appear to have a charge. So we're gonna call it a neutron. A neutron is just a subatomic particle. The term subatomic just means smaller than an atom. So a neutron is a subatomic particle that has mass, but no charge. And the, so we say that the mass or the isotope is defined by protons plus neutrons. So if this is our shorthand for protons, this is our shorthand for electrons. What's our shorthand for a neutron? N, uppercase or lowercase? Lowercase. And we don't technically need to specify what the charge is on a neutron, um, but it's, uh, usually done so that you don't mix up this lowercase n with anything else. We put a zero charge. Usually, if you don't write a charge, um, you can assume that it's neutral. But in the case of neutrons, to make it really, really clear and to make it look the same as these other examples, we put the zero there, um, even though it's not strictly speaking necessary. And sometimes for just for the, this class, um, I will, if I'm going to write a zero all by itself and I want to make sure it's not confused for an O, um, I usually will, will put a slash through it like this. And you get, that's a zero. That's an O. So if I want to say O with a zero charge, I might write it like that. Um, but that's not some Greek letter or anything. I'm just saying, I'm being, trying to be very explicit um, and clear that means it has a charge of zero, okay? All right, all of this leads to this slide. Every type of matter that we're aware of at the atomic scale or greater is defined by these three particles. How many protons tells you what kind of what element it is. How many electrons tells you what the charge is. How many neutrons plus the protons tells you the total number of particles in the nucleus, which is also the mass for that particle. So remember that that um, 
when I was talking about electrons and the discovery of electrons, they're 2000 times smaller by mass. They're so small, we can effectively say that they have no mass relative to protons and neutrons. They have mass, but it's so tiny that it gets rounded off in the sig figs usually. So with that in mind, protons and neutrons are what we're going to are the particles that we consider having mass. Electrons don't have mass. So protons have a charge and they have mass. Electrons have charge, but no mass. Neutrons have mass, but no charge. Won't there be an instance where you have to find the number of protons or neutrons and you don't give us either the mass number or the number of neutrons? So if you're not- This is where you would round this whole number. So if you're, if we're talking about an individual atom, then then it's usually going, its mass is going to be pretty close to a whole number. It's uh, when we talk about the mass number in a second. Um, when we look at the periodic table, though, there are some mass numbers on the periodic table that are not close to a whole number. Like copper, uh, the one I always go to is um, chlorine. Chlorine's atomic mass is 35.43. Not really close to a whole number, right? Most of your atomic masses on the periodic table are pretty close to a whole number. Uh, and that's, we'll talk about mass. Let's, let's talk about mass then um, once we go through this slide. So if we just say we had a, a random argon atom, how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are there in an, in, in an argon atom? Atom means neutral. So 18 protons. So atomic number is always the same as your number of protons. If it's neutral, you also have 18 electrons. How many neutrons do we have? 22-ish, right? So it turns out protons and neutrons don't have exactly a mass of one, but they're, they've they got a mass of one within sig figs. Turns out it changes a little bit depending on how big the nucleus is. When we get into nuclear reactions, we'll see that that difference in mass um, actually is what leads to that equation E equals MC squared. Um, we'll actually do some calculations with that when we get into nuclear reactions. We're talking about binding energy. For now, if we're talking about one specific atom, though, we're usually going to round to the nearest whole number. Most of them are pretty close to the whole number. But why, why would something like chlorine be nowhere near? There's a reason I didn't use chlorine in the example here, right? Because what's the atomic mass of chlorine? 35.453. Four, three, five. Four or five. It's that last digit has a little uncertainty associated with it, right? Because this is a measured number. And so different periodic tables will be a little bit different. Um, this is because chlorine, when you actually measure it on Earth, is actually naturally made up of two different isotopes. They're both chlorine because they both have 17 protons. And they their electrons behave the same way. But chlorine on Earth is a mixture of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So when you write the number up into the left of the symbol, we're saying what isotope we're talking about here. So most of the chlorine on Earth is chlorine 35. But about 25% but about of the chlorine atoms on Earth are chlorine 37. The atomic mass on the periodic table is actually a weighted average. Say, so, okay, if I if you took a hundred chlorine atoms and you weighed up the total mass and divided by a hundred to get an average weight, you wouldn't get something that's thirty five or thirty seven. You'd get the average, right? You'd get the the probability that you grab the chlorine thirty five times the mass of thirty five, plus the probability you grabbed a thirty seven times the mass of thirty seven. 
and we'll do weighted averages in that Excel lab in the spreadsheets lab this week. Um, but effectively, in general, in this class, when I'm asking you to count number of, of neutrons, I'm going to tell you what isotope we're talking about. If you're not told what isotope you're looking at, hopefully I picked an example that's close to a whole number on the periodic table. The ones that are really close to a whole number, that's typically because they're really close. Um, almost all of the atoms on Earth of that element are the same isotope. So for instance, fluorine. Fluorine's a good example. Fluorine's 18.998, right? Fluorine 19 has nine protons, 10 neutrons, right? Fluorine 19 is the only isotope of fluorine that, you're, that you find on Earth naturally. So that's why the, the mass on the periodic table is so close to 19. 18.998 because all of the fluorine is the same isotope. The other weird thing about this, you might have noticed that I keep saying on Earth, that's not just me being pedantic. It actually changes. Isotopic ratios found in nature change depending on what, on what planet you're talking about or what solar system you're in. Um, so in different parts of the solar system, you can actually expect to have different atomic masses. You would need a different periodic table. Or at least the, the, all of everything would still be in the same position. All the elements names would be the same. The number of protons, the atomic numbers wouldn't change, but the atomic masses would be different. And even on Earth, if you get if you look at certain um, uranium mines that have higher concentration of uranium 238 than normal compared to uranium 235. Right? And so those isotopic ratios are what we average together to get the numbers on the periodic table to, to get those mass numbers. So uh, I didn't put the example in here. We'll start with an example where, I, um, where you fill up. Actually, that was in, in the homework assignment, right? Had you, it gave you a table with just enough information to fill in protons, neutrons, and electrons for everything. And those ones, I was very explicit about which isotope you were dealing with, right? When I'm asking you to count these subatomic particles, typically that's what I'm going to do. Be very clear. I'm not talking about just a random atom in the wild. I'm talking about this isotope of this element. All right. So um, this is kind of a fun picture. It wasn't originally in. Color. It's been colorized uh, by somebody who likes science and is decent at Photoshop. Um, but this is a really cool picture. And this is kind of going, the reason that this winds up being a really important picture um, is because somebody put together the idea that, okay, well, if we have this way of defining our subatomic particles, we understand how they kind of work. That all makes sense. And Mendeleev's periodic table kind of makes sense, but why does Mendeleev's periodic table make sense? Like, okay, we're gonna put everything with similar properties into the same columns. That's gonna find gaps in the periodic table. Why does it have the shape that it does? So in the late 1800s, um, radioactivity had been discovered. Marie Curie was, had, won her first, uh, one of the first Nobel Prizes for her discovery of radio radioactivity. Um, and they started looking at what else was going on. Why is it that those properties repeat every eight elements? And then it starts, then it becomes every 18 elements after that. Why do they repeat like that, right? And so that question and trying to reconcile what we understand about nuclear theory and what we understand about Mendeleev's periodic table is what led to quantum mechanics, right? And so this is basically a who's who of uh, the early 20th century quantum mechanics and theoretical physics. Um, about half of the people in this picture wound up working on the Manhattan Project with Oppenheimer. Um, Oppenheimer 
should have been there. His his uh, partner, research partner, Max Born. Um, the reason that does Oppenheimer talk about why Oppenheimer was was the cream of the crop, why he got put in charge of that project a little bit. But he was the first to kind of bring theoretical physics back to the U.S. He was, yeah, he definitely was one of the popularizers in the U.S. But the reason that he had street cred with the other theoretical physicists um, was because of a, a work that he did with Max Born called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that basically looked at calculating the energies of electrons, how you could predict what kind of energy. Student staff, the teachers, please release the uh, swim team students for the bus. Um, so while, um, while Oppenheimer is not here, he probably was in the US at this point. This was taken in Solvay, which I believe is in Belgium. Um, but basically, this is one of the first times in recorded history where pretty much all of the of the international minds that were current on the research gathered in one the same physical location. Um, up until the early 1900s, it was really, really hard to get people in the same place. Travel was hard, was dangerous, took a long time. Um, this is one of the first cases where you actually have all of these brilliant people that are all experts on the same subject getting together and being able to hash things out in real time. Because before this, all the research that was done in the 1800s and 1700s on chemistry and physics was all done by writing letters and publishing articles. You would publish an article or you would send a letter and you'd wait several months and then you'd get feedback from someone else. And then you would do some more research and then you'd send another letter and several months later you'd get it slowed everything way down right. This is one of the first times due to um, the industrial revolution and trains and planes where everybody was able to physically be in the same place at the same time, or most of the, most of the um, big players anyway. Um, just in this picture, all of the all of the uh, bolded names. Uh, won Nobel Prizes. Every box represents a Nobel Prize. The green ones in chemistry, red ones in physics. There's a few dotted boxes in there. The dotted boxes represent they didn't get a Nobel Prize, but their direct um, student did. So there's a few people in there. Uh, is that the donor, I think? Um, but pretty much everybody else in here that's, this is some big names, and even the ones that didn't wind up getting Nobel Prize. Sometimes that was because their contributions were before Alfred Nobel founded the Nobel Prize. That all didn't happen until the late 1800s. Um, and some of these people were alive and made their mark on science and math before that. And some of them were mathematicians. And the mathematicians don't get Nobel Prizes. They get to the Fowler Medal, something medal, something starts with an F. Um, they talk about it in Goodwill Hunting. Um, I can relate everything back to Hollywood movies if I try it hard enough. Um, I, you also may notice Marie Curie is the only one with two boxes because um, she got a Nobel Prize in chemistry and in physics. In physics for discovering radioactivity and then in chemistry for discovering elements. Um, she shared the first one with her husband, the physics one with her husband who then died not from radiation poisoning like you might expect. Um, but he actually was run over by a horse cart oh. in Paris. Um, and then, but she shared her second Nobel Prize with one of her daughters. Um, she had two daughters, and the other daughter, the one who didn't win a Nobel Prize with her mom, wound up being just as badass. And she actually uh, did not leave France during the uh, Nazi invasion of France in World War II. She stayed, but she was a journalist and she stayed behind, and she was one of the principal. Um, actors in the French rep, uh, resistance, um, so acting underground, and she went on to marry one of the first um, attorney generals, attorney general of the UN, one of the one of the founding administrators of the United Nations, uh, who won a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Peace Prize, um, or maybe in economics, I don't remember which, but either way. Poor Irene was the only one who didn't win a Nobel Prize among her husband, her dad, her mom, and her sister. She didn't have a Nobel Prize, but um, she was still a pretty, a pretty cool individual. Um, 
The other one, they're always, this picture is, there's a couple of cool things about this picture. That's Heisenberg right there. They talk about Heisenberg and Oppenheimer, what he was doing. He was the leader of the um, of the Nazi research program into trying to make an atomic bomb. Um, and he, and I thought this before I knew he was the head of the, the Nazi research division. Um, but uh, he always, I've never seen a picture of, of Heisenberg where he doesn't look like a creeper. He just kind of has like a weird sort of like skeezy vibe. Every single picture I've ever seen of this guy. Uh, let me zoom in. Anyway, look up a picture of Heisenberg and see if you agree with me. If you don't, feel free to let me know. But um, the other, another, my personal favorite person in this picture um, is, where is he? Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr right there is, he was the one who always had the, the retorts to Einstein. Einstein's known for having all the quippy comments, you know, God does not play with dice. Um, Niels Bohr was the one who reputedly um, argued with Einstein the most. And his response would be, he would be the one that had responses like Einstein quit telling God what to do. Um, you know, he was the one who really disagreed very aggressively um, with Einstein, but they were really good friends for their for most of their entire lives. Uh, he was also functionally illiterate. Um, he actually had to dictate his his uh, PhD thesis, his dissertation, to his mother, who who wrote it on a typewriter for him, um, because he could not read. So he's likely dyslexic. Um, we don't know that for certain, but he was he was raised and educated well enough that he should have been able to read, but he couldn't. So he probably was severely dyslexic, which I think is a really cool detail. It's um, worth remembering that these people are all just humans, right? They're not perfect demigods, right? They're, they have their own flaws. Um, that doesn't diminish their contributions, just, you know, something to be aware of. Not that having dyslexia is a flaw. I was thinking more about Heisenberg, um, not, not more per se. So fittingly, we have a quote from Bohr. Those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. Um, one of the bit players in Oppenheimer, I still have not seen Oppenheimer, that's why I keep asking you. I know the history of the Manhattan Project pretty well. Um, and I know that, that Feynman was in, was cast in Oppenheimer, but I don't know how much screen time he got. Um, Fine, Richard Feynman's quote, he's another Nobel Prize winning physicist who was among the younger generation during the Manhattan Project. Uh, his quote is, I think it's safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. Um, it just works so differently than things work at the macroscopic level that our brains literally can't comprehend it. We can approximate it, we can use analogies, we can break it down and explain it numerically, but really fundamentally, matter behaves differently at the quantum scale than it does at the macroscopic scale. And so it doesn't matter how much time you spend on it, you can get to the point where you feel like, okay, I can kind of wrap my head around this a little bit, but it's always using broken analogies. Analogies where if you look at it too hard, they fall apart or using just pure math without trying to explain why the math works the way it does. It's weird. Electrons are weird. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to explain quantum mechanics in a way that makes some kind of sense, at least using a few really key analogies allows you to kind of understand it um, on, a, on a theoretical level. Um, but it's going to fall apart and it's going to be things that don't make any sense. And I can explain the why mathematically and I can explain the effects, but this is going to be the one that's, it's, there are a lot of the why questions are because it seems like that's the way that the universe works. Um, and we can't really process it much beyond that. Um, so 
why why do they start getting really weirded out by electrons? Well, partly because the nuclear theory said that, okay, well, we've got this nucleus in the middle and we've got these electrons around it. So the earliest model, the Bohr model, basically said, okay, we're gonna treat these electrons like they're just particles moving really, really fast like a satellite around a planet. Satellites take up much more space. If you look at the diameter of satellites around Earth, the diameter of Earth is pretty small compared to how big the satellites around Earth are, right? So if you think about all of those satellites kind of existing in a cloud around Earth, each one of them traveling around in a fixed path, that was Bohr's initial model for how, how electrons behaved surrounding a nucleus. The problem was is that they don't, if you measured electrons in other capacities, they didn't behave like a particle anymore. They behaved like a wave. And so uh, de Broglie, de Broglie is in the middle right next to Born. That's de Broglie right there. Um, de Broglie was the one who said, well, maybe all matter has both wave and particle properties, um, which he was able to kind of measure some things and show that really small particles always kind of behave like a wave simultaneously to having mass. Um, but they still were kind of trying to work through this and understand it. And so when they started looking at the electrons, the other thing that Born, that Bohr, excuse me, um, brought up is that it looks like these electrons only exist at certain energies. So it's not quite like satellites traveling around the earth because you can put a satellite at whatever height you want right you could give a satellite whatever orbit you wanted Bohr's research in his understanding was basically he was able to to come to the conclusion that you can only put electrons at fixed heights fixed orbits around the nucleus which didn't make any sense that's not how matter behaves at the macroscopic level right you can, you know, you change the, the energy a little bit and you can put a satellite anywhere you want it. Um, and so this is where, where the wave nature starts coming in. And so the, this is my broken analogy is we're, we're gonna look at it like it's a vibrating guitar string because how else do you explain the the various, the fact that it can only have certain energies. To me, when I learned learned classical physics and learned think on uh, how sound waves work, how instruments work, um, learning about harmonics really made a lot of sense. And mathematically, um, harmonics on a guitar string is really, really similar to the behavior of electrons. Right. So bear with me while I set this up for a second. It won't be that loud and it won't even take that long, but for whatever reason, I, I find this helpful to kind of understand the various, how the different energy levels work. There's the chord. All right, how many people play a stringed instrument? A few people, how many people know what harmonics are? Yeah, hands went down. So a few people play musical instruments but don't know their harmonics. That's okay. When you take physics, it makes the harmonics make more sense. So mm, the kids were playing with the volume on that. Okay. So a vibrating guitar string makes a sound. In an electric guitar, there's baguettes and stuff involved. That's what makes it electric. But what's really happening is the guitar string vibrates when you pluck it. And when it vibrates back and forth, that pushes the air and that creates sound. In this case, it's actually making the magnets vibrate and then the magnets take that, turn that into an electrical signal that's thrown in here. So it's actually the speaker vibrating back and forth. But the point remains, it's the vibrating guitar string that makes the sound. If you don't let it vibrate in the middle, you get a different note. 
it's the, still the same string, same tension. I plucked it with the same, roughly the same amount of energy, but you get a different note if I just put my finger right here at exactly halfway between where the string starts and where the string ends. That's a harmonic. String still vibrating, still vibrating with the same energy, but not with the same frequency. I can't just pick any spot on here, do that. If I tried to do the same thing here with my, put my finger on the third fret here, nothing happens, right? I could pluck, I could put the same amount of energy in, I don't get an, any vibration happening. In order to be able to make this happen, you have to put the nodes, the spot with no vibration, have to be at certain points along the string. The interesting thing about harmonics is you can actually take your finger off the string after you start the harmonic and it continues to resonate. If you do that, if I push down on the string, that's actually just shortening the wavelength. The string is shorter by doing that. And if I take my finger off there, it stops, right? But if it's the harmonic, we basically set it up so it looks like that middle picture. So if I just strike the string, like that, that's the picture on the far left. Strings vibrating, there's no nodes. There's no point where there's zero vibration. If I put a node right in the middle, I get the first harmonic. That's a different energy vibration than the open string. If I do it one third of the way down, You get a very faint one, and I think that's actually because I picked the wrong. There it is. It's a different note entirely now, right? So open, full vibration. I could put a note in the middle and even keep sounding a little bit. Or I could put a note a third of the way. Or I could even put a note a quarter of the way but I can't do it just some random point. If I try to do it just some random point, nothing happens. This is the wave-like behavior that, I, that Bohr was noticing about the electrons. The electrons could exist at this energy. They could exist at this energy or even that energy, but they can't exist in between only exist at certain points. All right. The other reason I find that valuable is because now I can, a couple weeks from now, when you've forgotten about this, I'm gonna be like, it's just like the guitar string demonstration. And we'll go back and we'll talk, we'll be able to expand on this a little bit. And this is really the easiest, the, the, the way that's made the most sense to me in my life um, for trying to understand why electrons exist here or there, but not in between. They can only exist at those set energies that are a result of how long the guitar string is, how tight the guitar string is, how heavy the guitar string is. Those are all factors that go into this. And electrons have similar variables that dictate what those energies are, what those frequencies are, where they can exist. But the point remains, they can only be in certain places. That's one of those weird, there is no other, there is no macroscopic analogy for a particle that behaves that way. That was the wrong plug. All right. So another analogy that we can use, and again, both of these have their flaws, um, is it's similar to stacking books on a bookshelf. If you've got a bookshelf, you can't just put the books at any height that you want, right? You can, they'll just fall. Where will they fall? If I hold a book right here and I let go of it, will it stay at that energy? it's gonna to fall to a, a stable energy level, right? That's where the analogy for the bookshelves kind of breaks down is 
literally the electrons cannot exist between bookshelves. They can exist at bookshelf A or bookshelf B. There is no bookshelf one and a half, no platform nine and three quarters, right? We only deal with integer energy levels. We only deal with energy. And the weird thing about this is if you actually try to move an electron from one energy level to another energy level, it doesn't exist in between them. You can get it to an electron to go from step three to step four, but it's not like you're taking a physical object and moving it. It literally ceases to exist on step three and begins existing on step four. It teleports. Even weirder than that, it's actually more like it it disappears. It's, I guess, it's the mathematical term is they use an annihilation operator. It is destroyed on step three and it's created on step four. But it's the same electron. It just teleports. Right? So, but again, this is why it's so weird, why our intuition just simply doesn't work. Trying to zoom in on that figure, if my screen is wondering. All right, and so when we try to increase the amount of energy that an electron has, we have to put in enough energy to get it to jump from step two to three, or from three to four. If you try to, to give an electron energy, and you don't have it set up to do that, if it's not the right amount of energy, or you don't have the node in the right spot to go back to the harmonics analogy, nothing happens. Um, this is the other thing where reason I like this figure on the left is you can think about the, the electrons as behaving like a standing wave, just like the guitar string, except that instead of being a string that's fixed on both ends, picture taking a guitar string and connecting it to itself to make a loop, but it still has tension and still vibrates. That's kind of what, how electrons behave in three dimensions. They behave in these weird functions that don't quite look like spheres. Some of them look like spheres, um, but they have these weird nodes in them where the vibration is is zero. I have a question about topic. Okay, I like those. So could you store energy, if nothing happens, you start storing like not enough energy to go to the next node, could you store energy in atoms like a battery? Um, so that's actually one of the, one of the things you had those, um, those green glow in the dark stars on their uh, ceiling growing up, or maybe still do, um, that type of glow in the dark light is generated by something just like that. That's called phosphorescence. So it turns out if you take, um, electrons, electrons, we usually represent their energy level or their shelf as as a horizontal line and every horizontal line can hold two electrons as long as one is pointed up and one is pointed down they're not really physically pointed either direction but they have to have opposite spin we'll get into that in a minute um when you take one of those if you shine the right wavelength of light on those electrons you can get one of these electrons to bump up to a higher energy level that corresponds with absorbing that light. Basically the energy to move the electron is found in the photon that comes in here. Now we have extra energy in here. If this electron falls back down, it has to give away that same amount of energy that it absorbs. And that's actually what an LED does. An LED is applying a voltage to excite an electron to a higher energy level. And when it falls back down, it gives off a photon instead of absorbing a photon to move an electron up. When it falls back down, it gives off a photon of the same wavelength as the photon that was absorbed. But some weirdness that can happen, there are some systems. So that process is called fluorescence. Something fluoresces when you do that that fall back down and give off a photon process. Some, some materials though, 
will actually go through a process once they get here, instead of just falling back down, it'll actually go through this weird little, they call them inner system crossing, where you wind up with both of them being pointed the same direction. And if they're both pointed the same direction, this one can't fall right back down to the same energy because you can't have two electrons pointing the same way in the same line. And that means that this actually has to flip back to being the other way before it can then fall back down. That's a slower process. Having to go backwards in energy and then fall back down takes longer. This process, fluorescence, happens really quickly. This process is called phosphorescence. I'm not sure there's an S there. Phosphorescence is slower. This is why those glow in the dark stars or anything glow in the dark, you have to put it in light, bright light first, right? Putting it in bright light lets it go through this transition a whole bunch. You promote an electron, and then because of the material that it's made out of, some of those flip over and they go through this slower process called phosphorescence. And that's why they continue to glow for an extended period of time after you remove the light. Even halogen lights like this, if, you, if you've ever noticed, these are working on fluorescence, but if, when you first turn off the light, they glow for a second, right? That's phosphorescence. They go through some amount of phosphorescence, not nearly as much as the glow in the dark material though. All right, we'll pick this up and I'll actually have some good stuff for us to work on on Wednesday.